Blog Talk Radio. You're tuned in to N5D Radio, the next dimension in radio, where we bring you the hottest, in-depth, spiritual, metaphysical, esoteric conversations and news with your hosts, Greg Prescott and Kendra Gilbert. Get ready for spirit, body, and mind to expand in three, two, one, 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 one. Namaste and welcome to N5D Radio, coming to you from the 99% Quartz Crystal Sands of Sarasota, Florida, every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, and 12 a.m. midnight in the U.K. I'm your host, Greg Prescott from N5D.com, and for the next two hours, we're going to be raising the vibration of the planet, galaxy, and universe. Tonight, we're going to be talking with Andrew Bartzis, who is a galactic historian, and uh, we're going to be really delving into the Akashic Records, and everything and anything is going to be asked tonight. It's going to be a great show. But first, I'd like to bring my co-host aboard, coming to you from Ocala, Florida, licensed massage therapist, energy worker, and artist, Kendra Gilbert. Hi, Kendra. Hey, Greg. How's it going? Well, I got my oil lamp going. My Himalayan salt lamps are lit up, and all I need now is a Ouija board and (laughs) and three other people, and we can have a seance. We do. (laughs) How are you doing today, Kendra? Doing pretty good. Yeah, I'm doing pretty good. Wish I could see the weather, you know, kept uh, that nice sunny streak that we were having there for a while. But unfortunately, we are, you know, back into the... uh, the cold dampness of Ocala Bumanji land. So, <laughs> so the, the sunny streak means something like uh, you had like two hours of sunshine yeah, there up there. You know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So definitely no hooping going on over here unless it's indoors. Nope. No. So, well, um, as far as the news, uh, we got some information uh, going on about Monsanto. We've got patents on common fruits and vegetables. So what in the world is Monsanto thinking now? Well, according to a new petition created by the human rights advocacy group AVAZ, Monsanto is attempting to exploit hidden loopholes in European law so that they can take an even greater measure for complete ownership over the food supply. And in other news, while the grand majority of Americans Americans feel that the harder you work, the more you'll gain in life, Obamacare is going to be there to rip the carpet from beneath your feet, leaving you and your family lying helplessly on your backs. According to a new analysis, the more hours you work, the less benefits you're going to receive. And that's not the only frightening truth to uh, this ridiculous and convoluted health care program either, like the fact that even Congress has exempted themselves from it. So with the recent buzz about uh, the brink of currency collapse and debt forgiveness, it kind of makes you wonder what the bigger picture could possibly be and what our futures have in store for us. And of course, you can find these headlines and more on the official N5D website in the newsfeed section. So back to you, Greg. All right. So just a reminder, N5D.com will be hosting our first annual Return to Atlantis conference here in Sarasota, Florida, on the 99% Quartz Crystal Sands of Lido Key Beach on the weekend of October 4th through the 6th, 2013. We have six amazing speakers lined up, including Lisa Renee, Teal Scott, Laura Eisenhower, Dr. Dream, astrologer Tom Kedacha Letcher, and tonight's guest, galactic historian Andrew Bartis, who has the rare ability to read universal and individual Akashic records. Included in this amazing event is a Friday night New Moon Beach Galactivation with Dr. Dream, a Saturday night Cosmic Reunion Party hosted by Earth Origins, and a Sunday night Drum Circle on Siesta Key Beach. Our speakers will be featured from late morning until mid-afternoon, so that'll leave everyone plenty of time to go sightseeing or simply enjoy the 99% quartz crystal sands here on Sarasota's Gulf Shores. Now, due to seating limitations, there are only 90 tickets available to this event, but if you're unable to attend, you can still watch our speakers on live stream. You can find out more info about the Return to Atlantis Conference by visiting www.n5devents.com or click the link below. Okay, so moving on, uh, would you like to introduce tonight's guest, Kendra? It it would be my pleasure. Um, Our guest tonight has 20 years of dedicated service to humanity as a healer and psychic reader, is known as a Reiki master and shaman as well. 
known as the Galactic Historian. He possesses the rare ability to read the Akashic Records. He's combined these talents together to empower people with the knowledge to heal themselves and their families. It gives us great pleasure to welcome Mr. Andrew Bartzis to N5D Radio. Hi, Andrew, and welcome to the show. Hey, Greg. Hey, Kendra. How are you doing today? Hey, everyone in the audience. I'm glad to be here. All right. Uh, we're glad to have you here. It's, uh, we've got a lot of people. 46 uh, people are online right now, and uh, we're, we're just, just going to jump right into it. Uh, Andrew, you and I are going to be having a, an upcoming webinar this weekend. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Uh, yeah, that's to help promote uh, the Return to Atlantis event, and uh, all the money that's going to be raised from that is to pay for the tickets to fly everyone, all the, all the, all the, all the um speakers directly to the event and help cover some of the cost, as well as getting people to, to align that there's going to be a live stream of that. You know, you can only have 90 people there, and I'm sure there are thousands that would like to listen to the event. And, uh, you know, it's getting people in alignment who the speakers are, what they're like, what they're talking about. And I know you and Kendra and Helene have some special things lined up with the Galactivation and, you know, some of the, the speakers will have roundtables. So it'll be one of those unique experiences to see a combination of two people together in a webinar room that you would have never seen before in any other radio type interview. Yeah, it's going to be a great time. I, I'm really looking forward to that as well. But speaking of Atlantis, what can you tell us about Atlantis and why people from the Atlantis Soul Group are reincarnating back to the planet right now? Um, let's look at this question a different way instead of reincarnating. Okay. Reincarnation is something that was actually brought here to limit us. It was a, a, literally a concept that was brought here to be a system of domination and control. We naturally are an incarnating species, and that's why soul families and soul groups are so misunderstood. We incarnate with soul family, or we incarnate in a bigger thing called a soul group. The day that you're born, there are, and that same time, there's somebody that dies and somebody else is born. In that 24-hour period, when those that die are replaced by those that born. So that day of your birth, there's a millions of other babies that were born and millions of other people that passed on this that day. There's people going out and people coming in, and that is representative of the soul group, the migration pattern that has come in and those that are going out. So when we understand that fundamental concept, Atlantis. There's many, many, many aspects of those people that lived there that were unresolved. And they were so unresolved because they had begun the reincarnation domination system where you don't get a full life review and then you get a kick in the ass and sent back. And therefore, you can't review your, your contracts with soul family or soul groups of why you're coming in. And that gets you stuck in a situation where you're learning the same lessons over and over again. And unless you have input from somebody else that's that soul family status, or somebody that comes in to be a big figurehead like Jesus or, or any of the other ones that history has represented, you know, it's a very difficult to break out of that type of reincarnation process. There are those that have figured it out, and when they get back on an incarnating process, they can actually bypass the archon grid that has been set up to control soul migrations every day. Atlantis itself is representative of a species that were part of Earth. Atlantis, Atlanteans and Lemurians aren't the first species of Earth. There's actually 72 first species of Earth, all resulted in the various time wars that have gone on. For those people that are new to the type of material that I'm bringing, I'm bringing the Akashic record of what went on as a total sentient experience for this world. Earth started as a seventh dimensional galactic seed plane. Its purpose was to literally bring brand new DNA knowledge to a brand new blank Akashic record planet and upload it into the crystalline structure of the sacred masculine or feminine there. So when souls decide to incarnate on that planet, they have a database of skin suit technology or animal technology or, or bacterial technology, because it's all technology, to incarnate in and to have experiences. The Atlanteans were really, really big on making experiences that they could bring to other worlds and have those experiences be a part of the incarnating process of souls that were coming in to have experiences. You know, there is this spiritual wealth of experiences that old souls have. And that's why the younger souls are attracted to the older souls, because of the spiritual experience and wealth they have. Many, many, many of the Atlanteans were spiritually wealthy and had tremendous experiences that they learned how to create in a physical form and then transfer across those, the galaxies and then implant this experience template somewhere else. 
so other people could have the experience, and then they could compare how each person experienced it differently. You mentioned soul groups and soul families. What are their purposes? Here's an example. On a soul, so let's say you have a soul, a soul mother and a soul father. And what that is is they're representative of somebody who's coming to a planet for the first time, and you need to go through your first incarnation process, and there needs to be a layer of trust. So you choose a mother and father. Usually that's someone you've been traveling with to other worlds at the same time. So you've experienced their type of energy before in other realities. So when you separate and the mother and father go off for new experiences, even though you're all the same, the mother and father concept is for the, the, the dimensional terms of going through the process of energy into a physical body. And as you come in, you could have brothers and sisters, cousins and uncles that are all part of your soul family. And you're meant to actually be living in the same area, be growing up in similar households, and to share experience with other people that you offer soul contracts to. And soul contracts could be, you're my third grade teacher, you're my high school bus driver, you're my first love, you're my first breakup, you're the first woman I'm cheating on my, uh, on my, on my wife with, so on and so forth. As many of the experiences you can. Um, you're going to be on your 14th divorce. An example it goes on and on and on and on so that the experience has a theme and the contracts are meant to be a theme and the contracts can be changed at any time because we live in a 100% free world planet on a 100% free world galaxy. So there is no limitations here other than what the reality sets up for the, the theme of the experiences we have here. On Earth, we have a food chain. So therefore that... When we eat food, whether it's meat or animals, those sentience that were those, those animals or plants get to experience us and raise their vibration and then decide if they want to stay in the food chain and keep going with experiences or if they want to raise their vibration and become a human and see the experience from the other side. So families, soul groups, all of that stuff, um, all, all of that stuff is uh, about experiences. The Atlantean soul families, their actual purpose, as I said, was to go out and share the experience through technology. There was another side of them that had been fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting, and they were sharing the war experience. And I use the word share because I'm trying to get from a neutral perspective here so people can understand what soul families and soul groups are separate of our dramatic matrix that we're functioning in. The dramatic matrix has hijacked soul family, soul group, and pigeonholed it into a concept that it was never meant for. It has limited it so much that the reincarnation process and the birthing process literally puts you at a situation where you will not be in soul family. It's very, very, very rare for a person to actually be born into a physical DNA family with mothers and fathers that are even soul families. Well, Andrew, when we talk about the star systems, the, the, the different lineages, the star family, soul groups, is, is that, if, explain that if you could please for me, um, is that where the soul actually originates from or is the soul itself eternal, always has been, always will be, and we have the ability to choose like a home base through our experiences of multiple incarnations? Uh, I'll paint a broad stroke. Um, when this universe was created, and I'm at the beginning of the universe, when our universe was created, there was one galaxy with only 100 planets inside it, one solar system, okay? Mm -hmm. So a galaxy has in, inside one universe. At that point, that sentience of that universe and made, it created itself, separated itself one time to make one galaxy and to make one galactic central sun with a bunch of primary planets around it it then opened up a what's called an immigration process and invited other souls from other universes to come and be a part of the foundational sharing experience of what this new universe was about. As souls began to migrate to this universe, it was needed to be bigger, so he made a second galaxy. And as he made a second galaxy, the first generation of immigrated souls had become energy beings enough that they figured out to how to form planets out of their body around the suns that were already created for those two first galaxies. And then those planets offered contracts to the new galaxy for immigration and spiritual commerce. 
And I'm speaking in this way because, and again, I want to take out what our system's understandings is. As souls begin to migrate over and over, you get yourself up to 30th, 40th, or 50th migration of souls into our universe, and we get up to about 200 galaxies and, you know, with a, with a tremendous amount of incarnatable planets on them. And all of the little planets are individuals who figured out how to become energy into physical form of a planet and then make a contract with a sun. And a sun is a group of soul families who come together and make a contract with a galaxy so that they may promote the exchange of integration and the spiritual commerce of spiritual wealth. Okay. And so when we're talking about star lineages and, and, and everything, the physical body here on 3D Earth, does it have to somehow match up to the spirit body of that person incarnating on this planet? Is that why we have the different races and the different genetics, you know, from different mm -hmm. cultures? Not really. It's okay. because of all the time wars that have happened here, mm -hmm. and it's what's known as the galactic ascension machine. Um, the galactic ascension machine is a remedy that was created because of all the karmic pollution that had been spreading by all the wars that were about Earth and Mars and Saturn. Um, and there were 66 prime lines of drama spread throughout three galaxies. And those three galaxies, the drama actually polluted as many as seven other galaxies. It had gotten so bad that the pollution was clogging the immigration status and actually holding the graduation process of other planets up. So many of the powerful light and dark beings that were part of the first through 20th generation of immigration from the founding of our universe decided to take all 66 prime drama planets and put them into one solar system. And that's what we are. They took all the pollution and all the things and put it into one place. And therefore, if you're a part of that pollution and want to resolve karma for it, all the migration patterns must head towards that plant, that solar system that's there to resolve those issues. So the rest of the galaxy and universe can continue without the cog in its wheel. So how does that tie into Zechariah Sitchin's belief that our DNA was genetically manipulated by the Anunnaki? It's had some truth to it, but the Anunnaki already had DNA relations to us, and they were actually lured here to be a part of the foundation of domination and control. They're a group of beings that also had learned how to incarnate here at, a, at, a, at an early time, and these energy beings were so big in energy, they couldn't fit into one skin suit. So they made tens of thousands and then millions of them. These 15 beings were actually 40% of our breeding population, and there were over 200 million people on our planet at that time. Hmm. So you realize how, how many of us there are. They literally controlled us through a puppetry hive mind scenario of literally being millions of people in a big pool of DNA and began the extended process of breeding us and unbreeding us and then bringing in other races to input DNA concepts into us so that they can continue the manipulation of our DNA. Mm -hmm. So the Anunnaki are just one piece of a puzzle. Um, it's not the overall piece that it's been promoted to be, and it's not the overall truth. You know, those Anunnaki that came were what's called a free roaming galactic species. Their planet was literally a ship. There was a unity consciousness drive with inside it. And for that ship to function, there were a group of core, core psychics that could communicate with the divine masculine of that planet and literally teleport it anywhere in the universe. Were the uh, Anunnaki benevolent or malevolent? They were both when they arrived. They were going through their own subtle corruption phase of, of being both light and dark. Because they were a free roaming galactic species, their purpose was to expand and explore and create some type of spiritual wealth experiences that they could use as commerce as they teleported their planet from one part of the galaxy to the next, to the next, to the next, share their technology on a DNA level because they were master geneticists, but they were also masters at war. And their first experience with war was part of the good guys, and they got really, really good at it until the point that many of their people didn't want to live on a free roaming galactic planet and just made homes somewhere else until finally their species had been thinned out so much they needed to invite other people to come and live on their planet. 
And as they did that, they brought technology in as well as other people that were very, very similar to them. These are the first existence of humans that were from the second fall of Lemuria. And these were time travel beings that the, the Anunnaki just didn't comprehend. Time travel to them wasn't possible. And then they learned that the time traveling was literally in the DNA skin suit that those Lemurians were wearing. And that's when they began the search for Earth and the search for the galactic ascension machine and the search for the 66 prime planets. And they spent millions of years teleporting their planet around in this massive searching network until finally they found it. But there was this carrot and stick thing done to their political figures by the beings that controlled Earth for them to teleport themselves around the galaxy and the universe and to finally find it at a point in time where the corruption was peaking in their own society and that would make them easily manipulable like clay to do the foul things like killing billions of people on Earth so that they could get a DNA reset. Hmm. And then using the technology and the karma of the Anunnaki instead of the beings controlling our world. It's like having a minion kill a, killing a village. Well, the minion takes the most amount of karmic hit to it because they're the actual ones that pull the triggers. So are the Anunnaki responsible for religion, or was that another race of beings? Um, that was actually the beings that control our world. They, they can see through time. They can leapfrog through time. Um, and there are other beings from off-world who have imported their own subject matter that was initially meant to be good and, and meant to help change the world, but it was hijacked by the controllers of this world and the, and the other races who ultimately understood if you wanted to have the best skin suit technology world, well, you had to compete on the Earth stage. Therefore, it's many thousands were part of that influence. Now, Andrew, you also, you've mentioned multiple times about these timeline genocides that have taken place, um, which is, you know, like the cause of this extreme lack of truth and knowledge that humanity is currently experiencing. So is this sort of thing just allowed? I mean, is it really to the point where free will is just allows anything and everything to go if they have the power to do it? Well, honestly, yes and no. When it starts to affect other galaxies because of one solar system, they step in. And when I say they, these are the remaining powerful light and dark beings who understand that the wealth and commerce of experience is what keeps the, the universe in ever-expanding mode. It's the total potential of sentience in expansion is what keeps the universe expanding. It always comes down to the sentience. And when you have a, a, a mass amount of sentience that are stuck in a system where they're not expanding, they literally stop the universe from expanding. So they do step in and they offer course corrections. And then the prime creator will come in later in this, in this scenario after the galactic ascension machine was set up and actually set up a foundation of a council of 12 that was four light beings, four dark beings, and four neutral beings and basically set up an outline that said in 480,000 years, this is where you have to work out. Everybody that's a part of this, this big drama, all of you are going to be stuck on this planet and learn how to become one DNA race. And then when you're done, all of you other races who've used and abused yourself with cloning and have been trying to take DNA from Earth and make it a part of you and then screwing up your own tree of life to the point where you can no longer have children the result of the Galactic Ascension Machine in this Council of 12 will be there will be a unified DNA skin suit that can heal everyone. Well, that wasn't enough. That Council of 12 fought and fought and fought, and nothing was done until finally the dark beings were able to kick out the neutral beings, and then there was a fight between the light and the dark until there were seven dark beings and five light beings in a Council of 12, and the dark beings chose to make sure that the sentients that were coming to Earth were much lower vibration than Earth's high vibration status. Therefore, they were reincarnating and reincarnating low vibrational entities and entities and purposely keeping them trapped there. And then they would teleport the planet next to a very high vibrational planet and kidnap powerful people off of that planet and say, come get me, quite literally. So the ascended masters or high light beings of this planet would come to Earth and they would get caught in the trap and then that would teleport away and then technological invasion would go after that planet after many of their light beings weren't there able to go there. There was also another process which was called spiritual invasion 
where literally they figured out how to get into the incarnation process of a planet and then send a mass migration of billions of spirits and try to out-incarnate the normal commerce pattern of that area and therefore literally hijack the planet from within inside. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've always envisioned that there's, you know, like this galactic federation or group of warriors out there that's, you know, going to protect the balance of things here on Earth and, you know, and, and basically the, the, the rest of the universe. And, I, you know, I've, I've really often wondered, you know, why has humanity been allowed to become so tortured? I mean, we are literally tortured here with the lack of knowledge that we have, the tyrannical governments, world leaders, agenda-based systems, religions, enslavement. I mean, so are you saying that really there are no victims here, truly, that we've really pretty much created this because of free will? Absolutely. And that's, yeah. that's, that, that's the part of it that is so difficult to put into the big picture. Um, there are many beings who were only contracted to be here one time, and then they got stuck because of the hijacked system, because of free will gone out of control, and because of these multidimensional beings who are trying to poke the finger in the, in the eye of the universal prime creator and become the new prime creator of a galaxy. Um, I mean, you have many different dramatic scenarios going on here. In fact, those 66 lines of drama, for anyone to graduate the galactic ascension machine, you have to be on the center timeline of Earth. And the 15 multidimensional beings I've told you about are in the control of that graduating timeline, and they're holding the graduation up on purpose, holding us hostage, because they're in a big multidimensional game of chess with, much, with many of the much older beings of this universe. I know you spoke a little about angels yesterday on your webinar, but can you speak a little bit more about this? Are archangels and angels real? And if so, how can one tell if they're malevolent or benevolent? Very good question. Well, we, when you say the word angel, the first thing that comes into our mind as a program sentient is Bible. Right. Remove that from your concept as I'm, uh, just as, as I'm bringing this concept forward to you. What angels really are, are high energy light beings that were invited to come and live in this universe to be a part of the creation and procreation process of an expanding universe. They are meant to be universal beings who can come and go to any planet and provide the light that's necessary to continue forward with procreation, even if it's the necessary of the darkness. So an angel can be both a light being and a dark being at will for part of the creation process of planets, solar systems, nebula, so on and so forth. That's the macro creation of what their main purpose is. Their micro part is to go and manage the spiritual wealth of experiences that are around and to make big multidimensional lists or menus for each solar system and then go out and promote this in other universes. So an angel, let's say Archangel Michael, take it out of the English context and the biblical concept that he was a very powerful entity that immigrated into our, into our universe at the very founding. He was part of the first generation. But he would also leave our universe. And when he left, there was another angelic being who took his place and took his resonance field but kept his name. And this is common among all the angels. They're in a constant rotation from one side of the universe to the other to different galaxies, as well as leaving our galaxy and going to other universe to offer recruiting for the types of experiences that these universal sources are offering in other places. So how would you know if, if, if one was, you know, good or bad? <laughs> That's the thing. It's your personal heart discernment. It always comes down to personal heart discernment, your linkage to your own source energy, to your own sovereignty. Um, so innately, how do you know a dog is a dog? Who taught you how a dog is a dog, that a dog is a dog? Who told you that a red crayon was red? Who told you that the sky was blue? You know, it, it, again, it comes down to the fundamentals of reality. You know, and for angelic beings, if you don't have the fundamentals of, how, of creation, how do you really know one's a part of a being of creation? Hmm. Or a being of inspiration, or being a being of hope, or joy, or change? Because angels also represent those themes, and their purpose is that vibration to make sure that the, the sentient's willing to go and experience a total free will universe on a total free will planet actually have the inspiration to stay doing it and not lose hope of the fact that 
it's pretty bad here. But at the same time, there are many millions of us that have wonderful lifetimes with nothing happening to them because they figured out how to work inside the system. And some of them, I describe them as happy as clams, constantly filling, filtering spiritual water. Hmm. Okay? I'm sure you've met people that fit that description, happy as a clam with their life. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then you have others that are that are absolutely sad, and it's not because they had a bad life. It's because they made a whole bunch of bad choices in a row and didn't see their habit pattern. And why? Because they're in a reincarnation process, unable to have full life reviews because of the free will expression of others to use domination and control. Therefore, powerful light beings like angels and demons need to be present on our world so that those are caught in those free will destructional entropy experiences have an opportunity at healing and learning how to get out of it on their own so that they actually can become a higher vibrational entity by having those extended experiences that they can't get out of. Very interesting. So I think our perception of what angels are have been just been really blown out of proportion. Absolutely. And because of that, we're expecting it to be way different than what it truly actually is. So right. that's very interesting. Now, and, you know, one thing that I've, you know, had, you know, not an issue with, but really just uh, it's very, very difficult for me is the understanding of what happens to us when we are, you know, at the end, of, end stage of this life, you know, when we're about to cross over. Um, and according to Tibetan teachings, if a person's light body supposedly is not sufficiently activated when encountering this pure light of awareness at the time of their death, that he or she will swoon into unconsciousness abdicating free will in the process until the consciousness is regained and stabilized. Do, do you subscribe to that theory, or can you offer any enlightenment on what actually happens during the, that, you know, death process? Sure. Um, I, I'm going to say this about all religions, and this is every single one, all of the major religions out there. They all got it wrong, but the Buddhists were the ones that got it almost right, but they still got it wrong. Okay, and they get it wrong because it's about the sovereignty and free will. I heard you say the 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 surrendering of free will. The surrendering of free will is is a concept that bled through some of the the Buddhist teachings that were really close to getting it. And getting it means when you pass on part of your free will because you didn't have an experience you wanted, um, that's the loss of sovereignty. And when you lose sovereignty, you get caught in the reincarnation process, and then it is just eroded out of you lifetime after lifetime after lifetime, and you're stuck in a pattern where you cannot regain those lost pieces of sovereignty because there's not a part of you that's able to even know that it's lost. So every time you go through a reincarnation pattern over and over again, there's another percentage of your soul taken away so that you can't use everything that's with you. Therefore, these lifetimes get harder and harder, and our life expanses get shorter and shorter. And sicknesses like cancer and heart and heart, heart attacks become more and more and more because we have less of time to experience more. At the same time, our bodies, which are the emotional experience bodies, are linked to our light bodies. And when our light bodies are fully in function with our, 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 our emotional body, we have a DNA intertwining. You know, our physical eyes only see a little tiny bit of the light spectrum. So when you're in a microscope and you're looking at the DNA strands and the double helix, you're only looking at that little micro expanse in, of the, the actual um, wavelength of light. But the DNA helix continues on beyond your visual sight into your light body. It goes all the way up to the tops of your light body and all the way to the depths of your connection to the background sentience that is Earth that we use to anchor our light bodies and physical bodies so that we're no longer projecting here but experiencing here. Wow, wonderful. I really appreciate that answer. Andrew, we have a question from someone here in the chat room. This is Ms. Uh, Sean Cohen. She says, how does your guest explain so many people who have had direct contact with angels? I'm a, I have myself had quite a few, and there are many, many people writing books about their own too. They're, they are real. Mm -hmm. They are very real. And at times... Our expectations is their limitations. The Bible has created a list of rules and concepts that fit our expectation based off of the knowledge and data that we've studied. And that's the experience that the angels have to come in here and work with. And for them to break out of it, 
there must be new people having experience with angelic beings and then writing books so that you can literally bypass or exchange or expand the, their whole concept of them. So those people that are communicating with angels, good job. Well, there's more to do, though. How do we expand it beyond the limitations and the expectations that are in our DNA memory based off of a system that has been around for 2,000 years and be written, written and rewritten um, in minor ways and major ways by the system of domination and control? Hmm. I'm going to look at the Catholic religion as a beautiful religion, but when you look at it at the top, it isn't a religion. It's a political organization. There is no faith at those top organizations because they make decisions that aren't faith-based, politically based. Makes sense. So uh, let me ask you this. Specifically, what should we be doing right now as individuals and as group collectives? Ah, good question. Individual, it's all about understanding the loss of sovereignty you have from your government system, from your media system, from the banking system. Money is an exchange for value, and, and there are no other planets in our universe are you charged to live on your planet. That's just one of those raw facts. No on their own out there. You know, they don't charge you to live on a planet. Our media is a propagation, propaganda propagation machine. So it's there to keep you in the system of money, to keep you in the system of materialism and consumerism so that you ultimately are stuck in a reincarnation pattern instead of an incarnation pattern. So it's about taking the personal time to say, I am the mighty, I am self of the present, making choices about the choice points that are being offered to me that don't truly reveal the full sets of choices I have. Example, why do we only have two people we can vote for in presidencies? You know, are we a really a representative government? No, we're, we're run by the few. But our propaganda and nationalism has been hijacked over the many centuries to make us think that a representative government of 503 people is, is enough to re represent 300 million. Okay? Mm -hmm. So when we begin to reclaim ourselves as present people that understand we have an infinitude of choices with free will behind them, we learn that there are other parts of ourselves that early in our life made choices that limited the present person. And that's where you do your... Have you ever had an opportunity in your life where you look back what your life was like before you drove a car to, to after you got your driver's license and see the big change in your life? Mm -hmm. We use that hindsight. And the mighty I himself is able to use hindsight to realize where we were giving power away. If we maybe we had a girlfriend that was a very needy and we gave her the power to be not needy anymore, but after we broke up with them, she still has that power. We can take that back at any time because it is, it is our energy. Or if we voted for Ross Perot in the 1990s and never took our energy back, that's still a part of the system. And that system is constantly using our energy to mine more sovereignty from others. Every time you sign your name, that's your energy in it. You know, begin to function a reality that you can still work with it, but it doesn't need your energy in it. Mm -hmm. Energy is and motion is intelligence. Intelligence is creation, and, and creation is procreation. It goes up and down the ladder of micro to macro and macro to micro. And we are both micro and macro expressions of ourselves as a soul being and as an individual citizen of different places. What other planetary nations who don't have free will, what have they done to claim themselves or to raise their vibrations in ways that are different from our planet? In other planetary scenarios, they have unity consciousness. And what unity consciousness means that each and every individual being on that planet has reached a point of 100% sovereignty. They've learned all the lessons that domination and control has to offer. And once you have that, you are, the individuals are linked to the dream time of their individual planet sentience. And once they're linked in their dream time in a sovereign global society, Unity consciousness is the result of all those individuals doing that work. Now, Andrew, you told Greg during your interview on Helene's show that we're currently creating the future by reclaiming our sovereignty. Now, how does that play along or play into the age of Aquarius that's supposed to be coming up here, <laughs> like, soon? I mean, is, is it a certainty that we're going to be going into the Golden Age, or is it possible that this opportunity is going to get hijacked and taken from us also? Yeah. And the reason I ask, I mean, it, it, it just seems like there, there's a lot of people that seem to be waking up. There really does. Oh, there's... 
still so many that are still in fear and denial. Or happy as clams. Exactly. So what are we going to, I mean, so does that mean, what does that mean? <laughs> that's, that that's, a really good, that's a really good question. All right. Coming into power on an individual basis helps the whole. So each individual out there that chooses to empower themselves in, in, in their own sovereign free will and begins to heal themselves of their, of their pains and sorrows and happinesses and joys and sadness of their life and begin to find remedy and resolution to the life that they've led so that their true mighty I am presence is in a state of happiness, joy, light, love, and an expression of creation and procreation, we get to the point in this that there's enough of them that it spreads like wildfire. June 2011 to August 2014 are the prime times in the position of our solar system in alignment with the galactic central sun as well as the, the suns at Alcyon and Andromeda. Um, there's a grand trireme on a galactic scale that says these migrating soul patterns from those three planets are all focused on the advance of Earth's sentience. So there's the Dreamtime world of other worlds that are projecting to us as individuals so that we graduate here and are able to defeat the system of domination and control by claiming sovereignty and having the result being unity consciousness, which allows everyone to return to their natural migration patterns and so that there's not this giant dam holding everything up anymore. So is it inevitable? Yes. But there's one thing to understand. We live in a world that time, the actual measurement of time, is a social agreement. And it's a social agreement that has been uh, used and abused many thousands of times. Times, again. Okay, our English language is written in a way that it's dualistic, like the word pray, P-R-E-Y or P-R-A-Y. Why are they stay the same? Well, things like that are done on purpose to keep you in dualism. Time and time and time, you know, there's different ways of representing are the same thing. Daylight savings time, Pacific time, West Coast time, Greenwich Mean time, different calendars, different religious times. Each, each of that is meant to separate us so that the social agreement of time can be used and abused by the system of propaganda and propagation of propaganda. So time itself, what does it mean? Five years? Well, that's the current social agreement our world is using. But in reality, unity consciousness doesn't use time. And that's why you'll hear me use a concept called no time. Mm -hmm. When I do the Galactic Historian, I am in a field of no time. I am not a part of the social agreement of time. And by that, I can function with the Akashic Records live, fully consciousness, and able to stream that information on a very high source and then translate it into human 3D linguistics with the proper intonation and heart space that it can be recognized as something that is not part of the social agreement of time, which is the fundamentals of domination and control of Earth. So what I think I need to just um, answer for myself then is if we're meant to experience this 3D existence and take every single opportunity to experience life, and what's here on the planet in this dimension, then, you know, enjoying the things that make us happy or things that resonate with us is either good or it's a deliberate distraction, which could, I mean, which would make basically the 3D experience theory itself a deception, wouldn't it not? It is. Because it would be counter, it's counterproductive. It's keeping us away from going higher up and going through, it, which is ultimately, you know, the ascension process, correct? Uh, let's take the word ascension apart for a second. Okay. Before 1960, you think the word ascension existed in the way that it's defined today? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It didn't. The word ascension has a light worker industry adaptation to it. So what does it mean to you, Greg, ascension? I generally try to keep away from it, honestly. Okay. And you, for good reasons. Mm -hmm. Okay, Kendra, what does it mean for you? For me, it means uh, going toward that enlightenment that is supposed to break us free of all of these 
all this junk that we're dealing with, the 3D experience that we're having right now. To me, that's what ascension is. It means it's becoming enlightened enough to understand things, fully aware of what you know is going on and the truth behind things, and it just set me free. <laughs> okay. No, I don't. I don't imagine myself floating out of my chair and going out the window. No, I don't. <laughs> Thank many me. many people do have that belief that ascension is that, mm-hmm. and that's an example of light worker propaganda. Mm-hmm. Okay, and it's not that they did bad; they just bought into the three D or reality that was being given to them and created with it, mm-hmm. created experiences with it, and some of them may actually manifest turning into a, a misty body and raising up to the top of the earth and leaving, because that's what they believe in. Okay? I also kind of subscribe to Santos Bonacci's theory about ascension with the rising of the colostrum, you know, um, in the body anointing the, the pineal gland, and, and I'm, I'm sure there's more to that, of course, because it's very in-depth, but it's, you know, it, it, is, it does mean a little bit more to me it does. as and a word, but I understand why you're staying away from it. I'm, I'm going to give you another answer here, one that, that you, you, you may, it may come at you, you know, as, you know, in baseball terminology, a curveball, but actually it's a straight coming on you. It just looks funny the way it comes out of the pitcher's hand, Okay. Uh-huh. Ascension is actually a soul language word that's part of our fundamental reality. It actually, in the intonation and vibration, even, when our, even with our sacred geometry and linguistics, has point behind it. And what it means is you come to the experiential point of the reality rules that you can learn how to unmanifest your physical body and turn it into energy. And what that means is you're at the point where you must master the subtle energy skills of the reality that you are living in, which is Earth. And the subtle energy skills that are here are is your DNA body, both the light body and the physical DNA that's in your skin suit technology. Mm-hmm. And when you learn to get the two to drive and function, you have the turbo boost of spirituality in the infinite world in an experiential body that is greatly different than any of the other species in the universe. This is the course of skin suits. It can have experiences that many other bodies can't. And the whole reason many thousands of races screwed up their DNA is because they got a sample of what it's like to be in these bodies and weren't able to graft the DNA onto their own DNA in one generation, had to do it over thousands of generations, and they actually had to remove their sex organs, which made them a eunuch species. And they couldn't have new children, so they decided to clone themselves, which ultimately meant they weren't able to bring in new souls as part of the soul commerce. And what that did, it extended their life into 30, 40, 50, or 60,000 years. So we, as the skin suit technology, are able to heal them in the end of this and help them get back to their sex organs. But how do you teach an 80,000-year-old woman who's never been pregnant how to have swollen ankles? Hmm. <laughs> yeah. That, honestly, that, that's the result of what's, what's done after ascension. Ascension just means you've learned, that you come to the experience and the reality. That graduation means you must learn the subtle energy techniques of this world. So when you go to other worlds, you already know how to re-manifest your body based off of the DNA skin suit that they offer there. Hmm. The other side of energy skills are that the actual skin suit you have, you can take to other worlds and literally adapt it to live there. You don't need it everywhere. It doesn't have to be a copy of what the other DNA is anywhere. Also, it means that you have codes to other solar systems. These are called uh, Stargate codes. And this is something that it is, it is a little difficult to understand. As human beings, our skin suit is so advanced that we can go to any place in the universe, even planets and solar systems that haven't been created yet. Okay? Where there are other skin suit technologies, other races that are really limited to the actual places that they've incarnated to during the last million years. So if you have a guy that's gone, he's lived on 50 planets, he can only travel to those 50 planets physically. So like our solar system, to get in here, you must have DNA relations or soul family relations to someone in the solar system to get access to it. And that is a fundamental rule of, our, of the reality of our universe. So you can't physically get in there. 
unless you have some type of relation to it. That is why our skin suits have been stolen from us. You know, DNA, uh, the DNA trade is so high because they want to graft it into their own DNA so they can have access here. And once they have access here, they have access to all the other codes of the universe and can go play anywhere else. Mm -hmm. You know, speaking of codes, I have a personal question. Before we met, you told Helene Lipson that my picture needed to be on the Return to Atlantis promotion due to some kind of codes that people will receive. Now, during a natal return chart reading I had with Lavendar, I was told something similar, that I would be unlocking the codes for millions of people. So what did you mean by what you told Helene? Um, I'll give this. We as a species at all times have an omnidirectional field of energy around us, and it's part of the fundamental rules here. And what that is, it's an it's a, a omnidirectional telepathic field that says, this is who I am by saying, this is my DNA that I chose this world. This is where I incarnated from. This is my soul family. These are the other planets that I've lived on, and these are my star codes. Because our DNA has been played with so much, we are no longer aware of this on a conscious level because that's been removed from the experiential body. You are still broadcasting that. The rest of us just can't receive it. Mm -hmm. People are going through these activations or gull activations like that will be at the event at Lido Key in October. You will be a part of a group of people that are broadcasting your codes and fully aware of it and can reach through the hazy confusion and curtains that are around people, their perception, and say, hey, hey, here's your code, here's your code, here's your code, Jack, <laughs> you over there in the back, you need this code. That's great. <laughs> say it loud enough on a psychic level that it gets through. Uh -huh. And when people come together, like Dr. Dream, Lauren Eisenhower, Teal Scott, myself, you, and Helene, and, and Tom, and Lesher, you have very powerful people that each have their own codes. Um, I'm in a unique position. I'm soul family to everyone that's in this dramatic drama here. I purposely incarnated on the other worlds that were part of the 66 prime lines of drama. I've been in every soul family of the system of domination and control, every soul family of the system of light, every soul family of the system of dark and neutral. I literally made sure as my soul, my experience was to be able to see the big picture from a soul family level. And therefore, I collected all the soul codes. And I am omnidirectionally broadcasting and sharing all the soul codes. And what that means is everyone has a graduation code. Okay? And that means I'm constantly sharing it. And from the first moment that you met me, I have given you my complete set of soul codes. And every time anyone listens to me, you have a complete set of soul codes, which means you can trigger a, a what's called graduation event. Awesome. <laughs> Now, we have a question from the chat room from Pablo Rodriguez Lopez. He is saying, Archangel Michael came according, accordingly to Nikki to seventh dimension, but according to Kelantic science, one part of that collective is in another matrix that wants to get our matrix into a black hole. Can that be clarified? Well, where, where does he get his information from, Kelantic science? What is Kelantic science? I mean, I could break this down over and over and over and over again. And you basic question uh, for Nikki, I was just on another interview on my Galactic Historian show, and Nikki's experience as a multidimensional being is functioning at the divinity level because the divinity of our world needs to be healed just like our world needs to be healed. You have, you have divine light beings that are stuck in a pattern where they must fight the dark until there is no dark left, and therefore they need healing. So this Kalantic science... I'm not, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying it's in the mix of everything else that isn't helping. It may fully apply afterwards, but seventh dimensional, I don't think you really understand what seventh dimensional means. You know, I can begin to describe what dimensional entities are like, but a seventh dimensional existence is vastly different than here and cannot even be related into, into, into a book format. It would, be, it would be a combination of lights and sounds and prisms that are an experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, how do we overcome our own limitations if we don't recognize them or can't see what they are? And this question is coming from Gary Skinner in the chat room. Okay. Limitation is fear. Fear is expectation. And, and they all can reverse each other. 
our expectation limits us and our limits are our fears. So when you're in fear processing, limitation processing or expectation processing is where you can identify the things you don't know about because fear is the unknown. And when we're in a situation of the unknown, we are limiting ourselves so we make it known. So anything can be done through the, the process, through fear processing, limitation processing, and expectation processing. Because we're experiential beings when we live in our experience. We don't have the experience or not the full richness of it. So how does one know truth? That's the ultimate essence boiled down of your question. How does one know the truth? Sure. Based off your experiences. We have another question from Sherry Elise in the chat room, and she wants to know, what was the group of beings that you came over here with initially when you were passing through the space looking for new planets and adventures and landing on Earth in order to help the Earth's peoples? Um, I, was, I, was, I came to Earth after the first teleportation of Earth where it was done technologically-wise, and it harmed the Earth. I mean, the Earth was near death from this technological ripping from its old solar system and being put into a new one. Um, it was near death, and it gave out a, a death well, and it said, if, if beings of light from around, this gal around the galaxies and universe don't come to help me, this is over. And I was part of that massive migration of trillions upon trillions of entities that heard the call, formed up in the void of space, and began going towards the light of Earth. It took us many millions of years to get there, but once we got here, we mass incarnated as animal spirits, as fish, as dinosaurs, as everything that possible, and brought our sentience and experience of wealth with us, and shared our experience with the Earth and healed it, even while it was in the system of domination and control. Now, Earth was also teleported more times and hurt again and again and again, and it was done on purpose. It's like wounding an animal or beating an animal to keep it in control. And this is what the light beings of today are why they have become so zealotous. You know, in, in war, when somebody has a white flag up, you don't shoot them, right? Mm -hmm. You know, many light beings have broken that vow where there are dark beings who have put up the white flag and said to Prime Creator, I give up, and a light beam comes up behind them, sticks a knife in their back, and said, I finally got you. I've been waiting a billion years, but I got you. In the face of this person, of that dark entity, surrendering to the Prime Creator. And that's where we're at now. It's the final play of the big, the big dramatic movie. Mm-hmm. Wow. And Andrew, you know, um, I, I was listening to a few of your interviews prior to this one, and I um, heard you say something to Helene Lipson about um, that we're actually working in the future to affect this particular timeline. So did I understand you correctly? Do, do you believe that there is such thing as time travel? Absolutely. We, we already exist in unity consciousness. That's the ironic thing. I live in unity consciousness, you live in unity consciousness, and that's what's called our dream world. Now, we aren't a unified global dream time society yet, but our dreams as individuals, sovereign people, as people that are what I call resistance or freer, the conscious explorers that are out there promoting, hey, guys, wake up, the system's screwed up, and then all the other things that come with the truth or movement. It doesn't matter what polarity then, the truth or movement is the movement, the movement to change what it is that this experience is. And what I said to Helene is I, we do exist in the future, and that in unity consciousness is what we're doing is trying to experience us in the presence so that we can reverse engineer the disunity reality that we're in now. To take apart the systems of domination and control, we must use our future selves that have hindsight that can help with the I am present self resolve the paradox of this disunity concept we're stuck in. Wow. Okay. I mean, uh, would you like to answer uh, some callers' questions and or, you know, what kind of questions sure. would you like to field? Questions? If people want to have a, a mini reading, well, we'll just say if you're going to have a bunch of them call in, we'll just limit it to eight minutes or ten minutes. Perfect. And then I could do three or four, and then we could talk some more. I mean, whatever. I mean, I answer any question. The entire case record is open. Um, though I will say, you know, as a as a person that's been a reader for 20 years, there are things that I don't say on air because, you know, I, I run into a lot of people that have been sexually abused or 
some of those things, then it's just not appropriate to do live on the air. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there is there is a a control system there, and that is simply to, to, to keep people's privacy because there are some things that could come up. I have many, many situations where it's just blatantly obvious that that's, that's on that person's energy field. Well, let's uh, kick this off, actually, with uh, my co-host. <laughs> Because you gave me an awesome reading on Helene's show, and I, you know, I, I'd love to see what you have to say about Kendra. Okay. So, Kendra, what I need you to do is tell me about the first 10 minutes of your day today, like right when you woke up. What's the first thing you did in those first 10 minutes? And what I'm doing is tuning into the infinite you in dream world who's going through the process of becoming the finite you. And in that first 10 minutes, your body is what it downloads the infinite concepts of your dream world. Even if you don't remember anything, you're still going through that process every day. And when I observe that process, I'm able to see you on a total Akashic record level and then help you, the physical Kendra, process the infinite data that I perceive and then translate back into 3D human linguistics. Wow. Um, well, this won't be that difficult then for me because um, I actually, the first thing I did this morning is, um, I, and I've been feeling a little under the weather also. I haven't been feeling very well, so I kind of slept in a bit, but I had a very profound dream, and it involved somebody that I know um, uh, not personally, but know of very strongly and look up to, and um, I'm not going to mention names, but um, this person was was shot in the head, which is a horrible thing, I know, right? Like, where am I getting this stuff from, right? But mm-hmm. the whole dream was basically um, very disheartening. It was upsetting to me. Um, I don't know where it came from or why I had the dream. Usually it's completely, totally different. I have dreams about different things. But, um, yeah, the person was shot in the head. Um, I then seen the person um, as a spirit or as a ghost and ran over to him and said, you know, why didn't you listen to me? I told you not to, you know, uh, go up against these these people and you did anyway and now they killed you, they shot you and now you're dead and, you know, why did you do that? You knew I loved you. It was just a crazy dream. So I'm just putting that out there. kind of opening up here um, a little bit. So uh, I don't know, did, did you need any more? Um, just after you woke up, what did you do? Did you uh, go get water, coffee? Did you rub your head and go, man, that's screwed up and try to review it? I, I got up. I use, I always go to the bathroom um, and, um, and I, I, you know, I, I was so in, in deep thought over my, my dream that I had this morning. I'm having a hard time remembering a whole lot of anything else. I know I, know I got up, used the bathroom afterward, um, went downstairs, um, got a cup of coffee, unfortunately. Um, I, I, tu- I, I've tuned into you. Okay. And really what, really what this dream was about is about your death and your experience now. Mm-hmm. Okay? You're seeing the friend because the friend is contracted to reflect experiences on you. And this is representative of the actual activation your soul is going through now. You're what I call part of the resistance of free earth, a cell of one. You came into this world saying, we know we cannot be in unity consciousness linked to everyone else, but I'm going to come up with a plan that's part of my life pattern. And as I begin to meet other people that are in soul family, I will share that plan. And that plan is ultimately to get to unity consciousness. And how we arrive at unity consciousness as individuals is vitally important. That's why I call you a cell of one. And you can share your concepts of a cell of one to many, many others, and then they can apply those concepts to their own cell of one and share information at a grassroots level. So what you're facing is literally the last part of your spiritual act. Yeah, one second here. Okay. Right. It moved the computer like one foot. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> That's better. There we go. Unfortunately, um, I missed what you had said there. <laughs> all right. So I wanted to get a drink of water. It's okay. Oh. Well, what I was saying is the dream is reflective of your activation in spirit world. The person is literally reflect in your dream world is reflecting what you're going, you're going through at the next level of your spiritual activation. Your spiritual activation is part of what I call the resistance of free earth, the cell of one. You understand that so far? 
I, I'm I'm taking it, and I'm going to probably listen to this several times. Okay. But um, I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> the cell of one has soul family, which means the system of domination and control can't stop you from using your voice and the omnidirectional presence that's you to say, I have a plan, who's listening? And those people that listen to you and actually get through, you actually get through to them, are the people that are soul family that are also resistance of free earth cells of one, who will then share that information in the omnidirectional broadcasting field that I told you about earlier, and then will spread at the grassroots support the need for change in this world. Thus, why you and Greg are on air. Greg is resolving, karma's the wrong word, um, a series of soul contracts where he was in Atlantis and part of the psychic network, defense network, that broadcast the incoming attacks that were coming to the world. And his voice was very much known to the consciousness explorers that were hearing these attacks coming through that were phasing through time because of the many different timeline genocide systems that occurred. And then Greg was actually taken into a scenario where he would literally speak to 10,000 timelines at once saying, there's a timeline incursion coming. If you are aware and have timeline vision or sight, take protection and you can survive the genocide and figure a way back to the central timeline and then reintegrate yourself. You were very similar, except you were off-world at the time trying to deal with the timeline incursions on other planets. Um, you were an Atlantean also, um, and this is representative of who you are now. The, the who you are now and the who you were in the other past on the other world that was describing the timeline incursions that were going on in other worlds to erase other time, to create other timeline genocides in other places so that one race ultimately would have never been able to come to Earth at all. That's how big it had gotten. And there was this, this galactic-wide resistance to end time wars on a free will basis because none of the high will beings, high energy beings, were going to step in and stop timeline genocide. They wanted us, the experienced people, to come in and stop it ourselves. Wow. It was ca caused a great deal of anger at those light beings and dark beings who were saying, no, do it yourself, which has caused so much trauma on the soul level, we have people here asking, why does God allow this? And questioning prime creator. Why? Because decisions were made not to, not to step in and stop timeline genocide on a mass scale. So you are here to say, wake up, people, just like Greg, to say, wake up, we can question creators of our reality because we are manifesting co-creating spirits who have gone through this massive remedy and resolution phase created by others out of their own free will, and we are reclaiming our free will now so you, those other beings that put us here, can never do that again. That's wonderful. Uh, wow. That's really awesome. <laughs> I guess that's maybe why I have so many dreams about being a warrior or some type of leader bringing people from devastation um, to safe places. And so that's, that's interesting <laughs> very well, much. Thank you. There, there's more there. I mean, you're, you're, when you become someone that identifies timeline incursions, you are a time traveler. There's another I am self of Kendra that is somewhere else right now locked outside of time, trying to figure out how to get back into this world and then reintegrate herself with all the other parts that have been taken away by the system of domination and control that has been removing our sovereignty one reincarnation at a time. Wow. So we're literally living within parallels and dimensions within dimensions, and we're part of all of them. <laughs> Let's call it paradox. Paradox. Not, there we go. <laughs> we are all living in paradox. The reality that we're living in right now is a direct result of the timeline genocide that have been done around the galaxy and on this planet specifically, and that means we are all a paradox. We live in disunity, remedy, paradox, reality. The result is paradox. Thus, why we're all being broken down to the tiniest little pieces of our original high energy selves so that we must reclaim the fullness of our free will from the littlest piece of ourselves 
in the most dire and drastic of time with no help from the high energy beings. And then once we do that, we get to look at those high energy beings in unity consciousness and say, never again. Never again will you have this power of this universe to do that and make decisions like that. Wow. That's wonderful. Um, Andrew, thank you very much. I, I'm very, very grateful for your time on, on uh, doing my reading for me. <laughs> Um, I would like to bring in a caller at this time. Um, this is area code 760, and I believe this person's name is Sherry. Sherry, are you there? Oh, I am, and I'm so excited. Hi, Andrew and Kendra and Greg. Hi, welcome to Five D Radio, Sherry. Hey, Sherry, how you doing today? I'm doing great. How about yourself? I'm doing very good. Uh, did you call in for a reading, or...? I did. I did. I would, I'd love to okay. um, find something out. I'm, of course, like most people here, in having a difficulty trying to find, want to be of service and, you know, really want to help the people here, but not quite being able to pull it together. Okay. Uh, what I need you to do is tell me about the first 10 minutes of your day. Be as specific as possible when you first wake to woke up. And what I'm doing, doing is tuning into the infinite dream world you and the process you go to become the finite world you. So give me about 35, 40 seconds of that out loud, and what I'm doing is tuning into your voice. <laughs> okay. Um, I think as soon as I woke up, I went to go get my cell phone and um, see if I had missed any messages while it was um, turned down, and then looked for my computer because I must be obsessed with technology. And I heard my kid playing on it, so I was able to find out where it was. And probably, God, I don't want to admit this, probably went to see what my Facebook messages were. So in the first 10 minutes of your day, you touched your cell phone, went to your computer, and heard your kid play. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I've, I've identified you, you know, who you are, what you are, and where you came from. Um, this is something that I do as a, as a psychic reader and as part of the Black History as identified species. And the type of species you are is an insectoid species that is like a combination of, a, of, of mantis and ant. <clears throat> that means you weren't born on Earth in the very beginning. You were migrated from another universe, and when you migrated this universe, you decided to take a physical DNA body that was representing the insectoid species, and the insectoid species is a non warlike species. They're completely heart-based ent entities. And they have a queen, and that queen is the center of their dream world that they share as a species, and that's how all the needs of the colony are met. When you were born in, you were born in as, as a scientist, a specifically spiritual scientist of the, of the insectoid community. The universe that you had migrated from, you had become essentially what's known as a middle-aged soul. You had enough experiences that the, the migration status was allowed for you to come into this free world universe because the experiences you were looking to share, and I mean share, were, were about sharing with the insectoid species. So you, you, you landed in the insectoid world, this is about 18 million years ago, uh, when you migrated from the other universe, and you spent nearly a million years there as basically a scientist, but at the same time, you ex in, in many lifetimes, you experienced every part of the colony, from queen to worker to warrior to trash remover, everything. You, you lived every, every possible existence within that structure. And at the end of it is where war came to that ant species, that mantis ant species. Now, they had experienced war before, but they had made tremendous allies with other galactic societies around, around to make sure that they were protected and they can stay in their pureness of their love society by trading spiritual wealth and, tech and physical technology with the other species so that there was a union of creation and protection around a few dozen planets that were in that part of the galaxy. Well, when war came, it came with the worst of the worst of the dark beings whose purpose was to enslave and enslave and enslave and enslave. It's what they wanted. Now, one of the races that you were in protection with, you know, a dominion scenario with, was beginning to be enslaved, and there was a need for warriors to step up into the warrior class. And this is where you switched from spiritual scientists to general war scientists. You rapidly turned technology that was meant for healing, love, and peace into physical te technology of war. You essentially turned a child's toy into a bazooka and figured out how to do massive harm to those, those dark beings that were literally enslaving another very peaceful race. 
And this is where your soul made a turn from being full love to being a, a warrior at the highest level and using your spiritual sciences, science to enhance the fresh new warriors that were going to experience war for the very first time in their existence. So you made sure they had the best tools in their hands, um, tools that also allowed them to heal after the war too. Um, this puts you in a very strange predicament because by the time that, that the, the, the dark beings that were in the area were kicked out, it had been another million years. So you had a million, a million years of war experience, a million years of peace experience. And at that point, uh-huh. the society of the, the mantis and people really began to fracture and break down, and they began allowing other parts of the colony to go out and make other hives on other worlds. Because by then, there were only one world, but they literally used their technology to go and start spawn new queens and other planets, and they rapidly began a colony, colonization expansion into hundreds and thousands of other worlds. And while they were doing this, they ran across other light being races and began to have a conflict on the spiritual wealth level. So it's more like competition because some of these species couldn't compare to the type of love experience that they could have inside, with inside the ant species. So they had to do, com- compete with them. They would send people into the ant society to learn how to do it and recreate it in another way, in a technological way. And this caused a great deal of harm on the spiritual wealth level of the ant people because all of a sudden what was their special little secret of how they made their, their, their system work was rapidly being shared with others and then being used and abused because it was passed on to other generations of other species who didn't realize that the technology of love could also be turned into the technology of war very easily when you need to defend your own colony. So this is where you, on an ancestral level, understood that war was being pervasive and was spreading around the galaxy so much that you felt you needed to go to Earth to be a part of the resolution and remedy phase whenever it would happen. And when you left, you didn't leave alone. You began a massive migration from all the different colonies to say, this is where we, as these love spiritual warriors, are going to incarnate, and no matter what, we have to survive to the end. We must learn to hide within the society our ant concepts because there will be systems of domination and control of that planet that will be looking for us on a soul level. And if they do, they will dominate, control us, and send us back to the hive to be double agents within the hive. So it's very important that you, you get into the incarnation grid and be hidden, be human, and forget your ant side. Um, you understand this so far? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it really it it it's tough a lot for because I have a, I feel so much of a duality kind of that I can be capable of extreme love, overwhelming beauty, grace, like I'm turning into a piece of light. At the same time, I get feelings that I just feel like destroying everything. Like I have this side that feels like it could you know, be something out of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and just spin around and kill everything around me. <laughs> and so I say, gosh, that's so strange, because it seems like such a duality of a person. It's very confusing. And, and that's reflective of the ant species in the te- and why you incarnated here on Earth. It's to be here at this time and to suddenly go into that super love power to turn it on because you're intricately linked to all the other ant species that are here because of our DNA skin suits that can omnidirectional broadcast our soul codes and graduation codes. You, you can become a very powerful sacred feminine that can broadcast sacred feminine energy and heal women, damage sacred feminine, by your voice. When you're in oh, unity you contract, con, you, you, in unity with the other ant people, when, when they had their activations completed and they're in the beginning of understanding that they are a much bigger being than who they are. And that the irony of all of this, Andrew, is that I'm allergic to ants. <laughs> <laughs> what a better way to argue. I know. Can you believe it? They bite me and I'm, you know, I'm just blown up. It's, it, that's, that's, now that's ironic. <laughs> okay, Sherry. Well, um, we're going to have to move on yeah, to our next, our next caller. I'm sorry, but yeah. uh, we only have so much time. So, But thank you for calling in. I hope Andrew was able to enlighten you a little. Oh, thank you so much. No, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I, I feel 
I feel very grateful to have that information. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Okay, next up is area code 850. You're on N5D Radio with Kendra, Here's Greg, and Andrew. Can we Hello? get your name? Hi. Welcome to N5D Hi. Radio. What's your name? Barbara. Hi, Barbara. Hi. Oh, this is so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to is Andrew some... all the time. Isn't he fascinating? I can't believe we're already oh, an hour and you. 22 just... minutes into it. Oh, he's fascinating. I just love him to death. I love all of you. Aww, I would like to give you. a little mini reading, if I could. Okay. Well, I need you to just tell me about your first 10 minutes of the day. Be as specific as possible when you first woke up, and I'll tune into you. Okay. When I first woke up, I kind of do a little body check, see if I remembered anything from my dreams, which I didn't. I got up. I went to the bathroom, went in and started some coffee, Opened up the window, fired up my computer, did, did you dream got on night? Facebook, lit a cigarette. Did, did you, you find dream me last yet? Night? Pardon? Did, did, you know, I, you I know I dreamed last night. I didn't remember, but I've had a sense of it all day that I was doing something important. Okay. But when's the last time you actually re when's the last time you actually remembered a dream? It was last week, and I was in a car with my husband. And we were driving on grass, and um, he said to me, he says, you know, I think we can get a little closer. And I says, okay. And when he pulled up, we went over a cliff. Well, what was so, why I remembered the dream so well is I'm terrified of heights. I watch somebody else look from a height, and I get sick. And all I said when we were going over in the water, I says, wow, we're going to fall into a lot of water. And that was my last right dream. That was your last dream, and you said it was about a week ago? Yeah, it was last week. Okay. Well, I've, I've tuned in to you, and what I'm identifying in you right now is, is a very old Earth-based soul, and, and the, the ironic part is you're not just here on Earth right now. You're somewhere else at the same time. Oh, my gosh. Um, you're what I call a, a, a split soul who did this on purpose. We are naturally multidimensional beings. We can exist in many worlds at once. It's a matter of how we split up our master consciousness. Um, as energy beings, we can manifest part, manifest a body and split our energy into 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 25, 30, whatever. And what that uh -huh. does is allow us to have multiple experiences in multiple worlds at the same time and the master hive mind, the oversoul, the high soul of that be of that multidimensional being amalgamates all the experiences and as one part leaves a, a, a planet and goes to migrate somewhere else, it reintegrates the experiences of the whole. And right now the part of you that's here is what I call the I am presence of that master soul. The actual hive mind is here with all of the tendril, tendril experiential parts in other worlds. And those tendril experiential parts are very old. They've lived thousands of years. And it, it was, you actually set it up so they would reach that thousand year mark or 2000 or 3000 year mark around the peak of Earth's opportunity to expand sentience and become awakened. So that you, the physical I am presence, hive mind self, could leave Earth and then literally figure out the experiential process of meeting yourself post-graduation of the greatest planet in the universe. Oh, my gosh, that makes and so much sense to me. And then uh, reintegrate all of the experiences that are in suspension, waiting by all these thousand-year-old pieces, parts of yourself that have been out there experiencing and waiting for you to light up the beacon that graduation is done and let's all find each other. Wow. I've been busy. <laughs> I thought we all were doing multiple lives at the same time. Not everyone is. Not everyone. Not everyone is. So, there are people that not everyone. Because I'm, I'm with a real light group, strong light group here, and, you know, they remember their lucid dreaming. I really don't, but... Boy, I know I wake up with the symptoms like I've been doing stuff all night, you know, sore feet, little puncture marks, all kind of crazy stuff. So am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Well, that, that's the thing. You are doing what you're supposed to be doing. You really are. But on a deeper level here, what aren't mm -hmm. you doing? 
What aren't I doing? What aren't you doing? Um, I don't, I don't like to mingle with people too much right now. Okay, why? We're about um, to have a massive galactic awakening, a massive... Wouldn't it be really nice to have a whole new, bunch of new experiential oh. friends? Yeah, oh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just tend to like to be around my awakened friends. I mean, it's, the last three years have just been so rough learning everything, and I swear to gosh, I was awake when I was 10. You know, I, I knew stuff, and so I studied, and... I have such a strong thing that I had to study about Russia, the revolution. and I mean, I was 10 years old, and I'm reading, um, you know, the life history of Adolf Hitler because I wanted to know why all them Jews were killed, but I think I figured it out. Mm -hmm. It's just been a complete soul search and, you know, how it is when you're the only one in the family awake and everyone thinks you're crazy. And, and oh, I've, always I know felt, that I've always felt like... Um, like um, you know, nobody understood. Oh, I'm a Buckeye, by the way. I'm from Canton. Ah, it's like you. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. your voice. I said, oh, it's an Ohio voice. But I, I'm doing okay <laughs> then. Hi, Andrew. Yeah, you are. How did you find out about me? Oh, I uh, I follow a lots of woo-woo things. I'm pretty much I'm retired, and I'm just pretty much on there all day. Um, I think you actually I do the OPT OPPT thing. KP, I think you okay. may even know Kim and Chris. Do you know the Mama Bears? Oh, you know I know who the that. Mama Bears are. Yep, yep, I do. Andrew, are you there? Yes, I do know who they are. I'm okay, here. those are those are that's my that's my light group. That's my 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 group. Hey, well, Barbara. Yes. Oh, we, we we've actually got quite a few callers and and uh, okay. Well, thank here. you, Andrew. You're welcome. Thanks Bye. for calling in, Barbara. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Now, um, please remember to tune in to N5D.com for more information about this weekend's webinar with Andrew and Greg, as uh, Andrew will be doing more readings at that time. So make sure you check that out on N5D.com. Um, next up, we've got uh, area code 631. All right, area code 631, you're live on N5D radio. Area code 631, are you there? Going on. Going twice? Yep. All right. <laughs> well, we're going to mute that one just in case they're listening. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess next up would be area code 111. Here we go with the 111s. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, area code 111, we're not sure who this caller is. It's a mystery caller. Obviously, it must be from Skype. You are live on N5D Radio with Kendra, Greg, and Andrew Bartis. Are you there? Mystery caller from the 111 area code. You're probably a Skype caller, but this is what we're seeing. Okay? Well, going once, going twice. You're on hold also. And uh, <laughs> next up, <laughs> let's, uh, let's move to area code 510. You're on N5D Radio with Greg Kendra and Andrew Bartis. 510, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? We sure can. Hello? What's your name? Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. Okay, good. Hi, Jennifer. Yeah, um, welcome to Hi, I was, I was wondering if um, if those last two callers were um, moved aside so that I could come in. <laughs> <laughs> kind of funny. Anyway. The synchronicity is um, abound. You never know. Yeah, exactly. Oh, great. Okay. Well, I, Andrew, if you have the energy, I'd love a little mini reading. That would be fabulous. Um, I do. What I need you to do is tell me about your first 10 minutes of the day. Be as specific as possible when you first woke up. And what I'm doing is tuning the infinite dream worldview and the process you go through to become the finite worldview. Okay. Give me about 35, so 40 seconds out. Okay. So this morning I woke up and I was reviewing a dream that I had that was somewhat disturbing and I was translating it into um, what the significance of it for me, and then I picked up my journal and I started writing all of the, um, the information that I was getting from it, and um, then sort of reviewing and putting it into the context of the bigger picture of what I've been experiencing lately and why it might have come on my doorstep this morning, had a thought, too, about how it maybe may a little bit of a mischievous entity or something, but... All right, I need you to actually tell me about what you did when you woke up. Like, what's, what did uh, you actually do when you woke up? What do you remember? 
Did you rub your um, eyes? Did you try to? Yeah, so I opened up my eyes. Okay, so I, I I opened up my eyes. I realized I was awake. I sat there, you know, in my bed thinking for a while. Okay, and then I picked up my journal. I wrote in my journal, and then um, and then I how, got how, up. How long? How long was it before you wrote in your journal to the point that you woke up? Probably about. God, timing is so hard at that space. Um, maybe know. about 10, 10 minutes or so. All right, so that, that's beyond the window that I'm looking for. Oh, I need to boy. know before okay. that, that's that first 10 minutes. And it's important okay. because what I'm doing, when you jump forward into time, which is a social agreement, you re enter the system, your body okay. has lost its dream processing. And one of the things, I mean, because I've been tuning into you, I'm seeing the, the scenario that you're going through, and you're missing tremendous parts of it because you didn't properly process the dream world into your cellular memory. And this is something that's been going on to you for a very long time. Because of some of the core issues at heart here, uh, when you grew up, did your parents constantly yell at each other? Were they in yelling matches and never resolving stuff? Pretty much. <laughs> there you go. Yep which means you were an emotional sponge to that energy, and every time you went to sleep or woke up, there was the expectation that that yelling energy was coming, or you had to go to sleep or wake up to it, which ultimately caused serious damage to your dreaming body because you already know you're a, you're a very high-level empath as with the ability to have psychic projections and remote experiencing, but the fundamental talent is tainted by the fact that as a kid you had to sponge that energy, and that's ultimately what you have to do on the physical body layer is to purge that energy that's still inside you from those arguing parents who didn't know that you were an emotional sponge and a psychic sponge. Right, right. And then everything that you're doing right now will make more sense. And then I'm going to describe it this way. You're one color away from completing your Rubik's Cube puzzle of who you are, what you are, and what you're supposed to be doing. Yay. But to get that one color, you have to scramble all the colors and figure out the equation to finish it again. You ever do? You ever use a Rubik's cube? Uh, n n no, I don't. As a matter of fact, you've never once held one. What? You've never once held a Rubik's cube or used one. Oh no, I have. I have, and and yeah. So I mean, definitely all the layers and the colors were fascinating. I think I got kind of with it honestly right because the type of challenge that it was wasn't the experience you're looking for and what you're going through right now you actually contracted yourself to be in that family to have that experience so that right. you'd have to figure out the Rubik's Cube puzzle of your soul so that during the grand awakening you would be awake early ahead of early or, or just before the end that's your soul's goal this lifetime is to unravel the Rubik's Cube of all the stuff that your soul decided it wanted to resolve this lifetime with this set of skills, psychic skill sets, with this set of family, so that when the time of the awakening came, you could let off a fireworks signal and say, this is who I am, these are my skill sets, and I can help a whole bunch of people. Right. Well, I, I mean, I feel like I got a lot of that information, um, but what's confusing me, Andrew, is less about what I'm doing here and my skills and more about this grief about being here and this well, the resistance grief and, and the anger about being here because it doesn't feel like my home. And, it, isn't. Um, it isn't your home. You're stuck. The thing yeah. is, you're in a reincarnation pattern and you figured the puzzle out thousands of times before and then went back to the astral world got a life review that wasn't accurate enough to help you understand you're in the reincarnation pattern, and then got kicked back into a body that had no, uh, into a family that had no body, into a family that had no soul family, and your mind was wiped, and you had to start all over again. Right. You're solving the same puzzle over and over and over again, and that's your soul-based anger. You're stuck. So this idea of, like, My, the awakening, I, does that mean I get to go home? Or, I mean... Yeah. It means you get to go home. But... To go home, we all have to do it in unity consciousness. That means we have to share our experience of how we reclaimed our sovereignty, how we all solved our own paradoxes and puzzles, and then share it in such a way that we start a grassroots movement of people wanting to do the same thing because they all want to go home. They all want to resolve the puzzle they're stuck in, the, the, the prison cells many of us have been locked into. 
We all want resolution and remedy in the most neutral way so that so that victory is instead of remedy. That's really what it is. Remedy and resolution instead of victory. Yeah. Victory instills war concepts. We don't want victory. We want remedy and resolution to the scenarios that free will expressions of beings at very high level and at very low level have used the, abused and abused the rules of this reality and free will. Right. So as a minor comfort, is there any um, way that you can talk, tell me about my... Sure, when's oh, the last time my... you did a fast? Pardon me? Yeah, when's the last time you did a fast? Well, I've been doing a fast for a bunch of... <laughs> I've, been, uh, I've been playing... I've been on that edge for quite a long time. My whole eating thing is just crazy right now. I've been, so you've I've never been done eating a fast very little. Uh, you've never done a fast. I've done one fast, yeah. And but you eat very little. But I I have trouble. I have a problem with eating. Yes, my my whole okay. digestive well, that's system. A separate is, issue. That's a separate yeah, okay. issue. That's part of your spiritual puzzle. And the fact that you're eating little says that you need to fast because uh-huh, you need okay. your food to process so that you properly process your dream time energies. Because to have expanded dreams. You need to have energy so that the body, when it goes to sleep, has stored energy. So when it goes through the awakening process, that stored energy is converted to the process that allows the infinite world, dream world, to be stored in your cellular memory and that the mind, as it's awakening, is the tool that enforces it into cellular memory instead of awake memory where it can be forgotten 10 minutes or 20 minutes or two hours away from the point that you wake up. So you need to eat right and then fast. And what you're looking for on fasting is that you stop pooping seven or eight days into the fast, and you need to drink a tremendous amount of water. Right now, your water energy, your elemental water energy is like near zero. Yeah, okay. Okay? I mean, how many glasses of water do you drink a day? Well, I know how much I'm supposed to drink, but maybe two or three right now. So... You're supposed to have 80 ounces of water, and you're drinking little less than 20. Right. So you're you're literally starving yourself for water and almost starving yourself for food. Right. Because I don't want to be here. So what, you're <laughs> do, what you're going to do is you're going to feed yourself really, really good carrots, vegetables, kale, all the power foods, dandelions, right. um, juice if you could juice for for six, yeah. five or six days. Eat heavy amounts of vegetables. And then okay. once you, you start noticing your stool to change color to being all in the vegetable style, you're going okay. to do a fast. And what you're going to do okay. is go and get a colonic or a home enema. And this will save you tremendous amount of pain on the fast if you do the enema or the colonic. All right? Okay. Yeah. Because what it's going to do is purge out all the leftover uh, leftover vegetables that are in there and anything that's hardened that hasn't been processed for a long time. All of that negative psychic data I told you about when you were a kid is stored into those hardened foods that are stuck on the intestinal walls. And quite right. literally, they psychically stick to the inside of your walls, so you can almost never get rid of them until you do a proper cleansing of the colon and actually get rid of those psych- that psychic data You've been storing from all of the times when your parents were arguing. Well, plus on all my clients who I counsel all of them that too. too. That too. Yeah. So you need to do that at a very dedicated, serious level. And okay. I actually recommend if you do a six-day fast, at the end of it, do another colonic. Because there are okay. people that I've known that have gone 30 days and are still pooping. Uh-huh. All right? And then there are other yeah. people that as soon as they stop eating, they stop pooping. And they actually never complete their fast because the whole point of a fast is to purge your colon of absolutely everything until the only thing that's coming out of you is what looks like a black water. When you All reach right, that okay. black water layer, you're breaking down the final mucus layer that's the barrier between the tar paper that's on the inside of the intestinal wall, which is solidified food particles that has a mucus layer over it. And that solidified layer, that mucus layer, once it breaks down, the tar paper breaks off, and that's why it looks like a black water. And once you start seeing that black water, 
you know, uh, within mm-hmm. a day or so, your fast is done. When you're done crapping out black water, you, your fast is done. And then eat like a horse. Eat vegetable, dale, canned dandelions, carrots. You could even have some meat. I would recommend no pork. Um, but whatever you put in, you want to rapidly digest it and take probiotics. Restart all of the gut intestinal stuff that you can. And you may need to take the probiotics for as many as four or five days, twice a day with every meal. And what you're going to notice is you are going to have a tremendous psychic reawakening, and then you're going to realize this giant weight is out of your gut, and this giant weight is out of the way you download and process dreams. Your dreaming body, when it leaves your body, goes through your intestinal tract. And when it comes back in, it goes, through, it goes back through the intestinal tract, which is a medium of negative psychic information that you stored from your, parent, your, your parents. And that's why the dream world is incomplete, and that's why this puzzle is such a hard puzzle to solve. Well, that's some really great advice, wonderful advice. Jennifer, we have yeah. got quite a few callers left, and we only have a few minutes left in the show. Um, but I hope okay. that um, everything goes well for you, and we appreciate you calling in very much. Thank you very much, Andrew, uh, Andrew and thank you for the host. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Jennifer. Take care now. Okay, Did you, do you have any questions about what the, the, those that I've read? No, I don't. Uh, do you, Kendra? Uh, no, it's just a lot of information. Um, wow. I mean, I, but <laughs> like somebody else said in the chat room earlier, it's going to take a couple of uh, <laughs> listen-throughs to really absorb all of this. It's been a wonderful show. I, mm-hmm. I just think it's very eye-opening, very, wow, <laughs> awesome. So, Greg, we're kind of running out of time here. Did, did, um, how do you want to handle this? We have quite a few callers left, and I know um, – Andrew, you're probably starting to get a little bit on the on the tired side here, so keep going with callers if you want. We do another call. Okay. Uh, All right, great. Thank you. So great. next up is what seven seven two. Uh yes, actually, I was scanning. Oh, it's all the way up here at the top. Okay. All right, so seven seven two, you're on in five D radio. How are you? Hello. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes, we yes, sure but... can. What was your name? My name is Marge. Hi, Marge. Hi, Marge. Hi, Kendra. Hi, Greg. Hello, Andrew. Hey, Marge. How are you doing today? Just really excited right this moment. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've been trying to get to Andrew's website to get a reading, and he's never going to be on books. <laughs> but that's awesome because I knew you existed somewhere in time, and I'm so happy you're here. Well, thank I would, you. I'd like to get one of those mini readings, if I could, please. Very much. I, I can do that for you. What I need you to do is tell me about your first 10 minutes of the day. Be as specific as possible when you first woke up. Um, just okay. like the other callers, you kind of you got to make sure you stay in that 10-minute window. Um, okay. Because I'm literally tuning into how you go through the process of infinite to finite. So you do that out loud for about 35, 40 seconds. Okay. This morning I, I woke up. I was allowing myself extra time waking up and I was doing some stretching, looking around the room. Then I got up, I I walked to the restroom, and then, you know, the usual wash your face and comb your hair, do the teeth. Went out into the kitchen and I realized my, I have a lot of plants that like a lot of water, so I fed them their water. I drank some water, and um, then I uh, started to get ready for my day, getting dressed, and uh, I had an eye doctor's appointment, but now we're past the 10 minutes. Okay. So the first thing you did was went right to the bathroom. Well, I stretched, did some stretching. Stretched first. and then went to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. All right, that's actually very significant to your dream world. Right now, you're going through a purge in your dream world. Um, did you do a lot of traveling to different cities when you were younger? Uh, I moved around a lot, yes. Mm-hmm. Or would you say you know, during your teenage years you moved around a lot, a lot? Uh, no, no, not in my teenage years, no. When, when no, I, did, I visited teenage... people, though, you know. You visited because what I'm sensing is you've been a part of the Sacred Geometry Dream City many, many times, and what it is is you, you've been hyper-attached to different fake dream worlds, and your dreaming body is now purging themselves of being fooled into these fake dream worlds. 
And as you're purging yourself, literally the need to go to the bathroom is this regular process. You are, you are literally trying to expel the false information that your dream world got hijacked from. When I use that hijack, it's not necessarily in a negative way. It just means you are not, you in the dream world, you weren't having the experiences that you were contracted to have with other dream time entities. Now, it, it appears that about six years ago or five years ago, there were a group of dream time entities in a, in a dream time society that came to you in a dream level and began um, whispering to your dream time and, and yourself that this isn't real and that you needed to create your own space, your own dream space. Do you have a desire to go do like a dream class or a vision class or anything like that? Well, I, I used to have a lot of dreams, and then I started doing something. I don't know if it was astro travel or projection, whatever you want to call it. And I had a bad experience, so I kind of um, was a little cautious of where I'd allow myself to go. Okay. But did you have the desire to have a dream experience or a vision quest or something like that in your life? Oh, yes, I'd love to. Okay, was that something you dreamed of during the day? Is that something you daydreamed of? Um, I, I've i always wanted a lot, not just dreams, other things, too, that I, I think about a lot. Okay. You know, I've always done the... The reason, uh, the, reason, the, the reason I ask this, similar to the other caller, you're going through this gut purging process on a natural level, and you need to have your physical awake spirits that is you, needs to go through a spirit purging process. Um, there have been multiple entities that have been attracted to you that cause you to have a very negative dream experience which drains your kundalini energy right out of your root chakra, right, right out of your tailbone. As I'm looking at you, I'm looking at it at 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 looks like a compacted tailbone, like you were falling off a chair and then your tailbone compacted and got broken. But I have a lot energy of energy level. This is Okay, well, which is relevant to the spirit attacks that you've gone through over your life because of being in a hijacked dream world, you're regularly on a list of to be harvested for energy. You know, it's just like they, you know, you'd stop into, into a, a store to pick up, you know, milk and eggs. You know, you know, oh, let's stop by Marge. She's got Kundalini energy for us. I need milk and eggs. What can okay, I do about so for you, it's about defining your personal sovereignty and space identify what's your sacred space and say, I do not allow anything in here unless I invite it in. Are you familiar with my contract revocations? I have done them, yes. Okay. I think it's time you made one specifically for you. I'm that working defines on that. Your, your dream space in your awake space. And if you look at the three, the banking, the media, and, and, the, and the government revocation, they start with a spiritual, a true and proper spiritual court of equity. When you use that as a setup, you bring your ancestors into the presence and the other beings of the earth that are other ancestors of other places into the presence to hold space so that when you declare your sovereign free will, the other entities that have been harvesting your free will can't come in and say, I've got a piece of paper that says I can do this, this, and this, and therefore you don't have an I am presence will. So the ancestors are your barrier from people using your other sovereign parts, your other so sovereign parts you gave away against you. And then you can literally reclaim all of your individual parts that have been slowly eroded away by being in all these other sacred geometry dream cities instead of being in your natural dream state. Um, so I think it's very important, you know, just as just as if the other caller goes and does a colonic, you do you begin the spiritual purging process, so that the reclaiming of your free will is followed up by a declaration of I do not want this energy in my field, and be very specific about it. And you have to bring up that negative dream experience you had, that negative vision experience, and you can make sure that it is understood in that spiritual court of equity that this is a violation of my free will, and I do not want it in my energy. I do not want this experience. And get angry. And I mean get angry when you're writing okay. it. 
I can get it. revengeful, but allow the anger to feel the writing. And then when you read it out loud, read it with passion, read it with anger, because it's your free will that has been eroded from you. Okay. All right, Andrew, thank you so very much. I, I certainly do appreciate it. Yes, it was nice talking to you, and I'll try to get in touch with a reading from you at some point. Are you going to Key West in October? I will, I, I will be at Lido, uh, Lido Key um, for the, uh, the event there. I'm still trying to determine if I'm going to have time afterwards to do private readings. Um, it's a oh, little yeah. far in advance right now, and I'm trying to – I'm going to be setting up some webinar rooms where I'll be able to take care of the massive load of people that are wanting readings. So I'll be redoing my live reading show on a webinar basis. And that'll okay. help take care of the big backlog. So if you stay tuned to my webpage and my Facebook page or here with Bin 5D because we're going to be doing a series of webinars that can promote the, the Return to Atlantis event so that it can help uh, make sure all the, all the people that are coming to there get plane tickets and all that other wonderful stuff. So it's going to be a perfect event. Okay, great. Thank you so much for all that you do, Andrew. Thank you, Greg. You're welcome. Thanks, Sandra. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you, too. You're very welcome. Thank you. Andrew, I, I, I believe that there's a, a non-Earth entity at the top of the pyramid. Is it possible that it's a malevolent, malevolent race of beings who control humanity on Earth? The top of the pyramid? That's yeah. The 15, that's the 15 multidimensional beings that I talk about in many, many, many of my shows. And their purpose is to literally thumb prime creator in the eye and say, I'm going to be the new prime creator I abuse and abuse the free will of billions. Stop me. They're literally tempting and daring the free will of the prime creator to, to come in here and break his rule of spawn interference. Mm -hmm. okay. So, yes, there is malevolent. There's many. There's more than 15. There are light beings and dark beings. You know, there are light beings who, who have gone so far up the butt of light that they're no longer light beings. They're just hired hunt, headhunters. Okay, mm -hmm. that have a that have a, a, a sergeant's patch from the angelic units on them, or reverse, you have a dark being that is so tired of being dark they're doing good, trying to end this machine. Mm -hmm. So we're at this point where the the top is fighting itself, the bottom is trying to figure out who's who, where do we come from, what's this amnesia that I'm waking up from? Oh my God, you know I don't belong on this planet. Why am I here? The confusion of the people awakening, and, and it takes people like you and Kendra and me and all the other people in the truth movement, separate of the, the fear propaganda uh, and the fear porn, to say, hey, where do we start? How mm -hmm. do we use our hearts to determine what's true? Because I get asked all the time, how do you know the Acacia records are real? And the answer is personal discernment, focus, understanding fear processing, limitation processing, and understanding that your expectations are your limitations. When you live in the now moment of the I am presence, the truth is in your heart and in the resonation of the, the vibrations around you. And it is your focus that listens to the words of yourself or me or Greg or Kendra and say, I resonate with that in the I am presence, separate of the culture of domination and control that is here to define our reality and limit our, limit our, our experience. Um, I, I was just uh, curious also, I mean, is there, so are there any particular race of um, extraterrestrial that, you know, are a direct threat to us as, as uh, humanity is concerned? There's, I mean, are there? There's 5,383 separate races that are here to defend us. Wow, never quite before, an army. <laughs> never before in the history of our universe have that many plant, that many different species come together to help a single planet. At the, at the same time, there are 3,883 separate species, separate of the good guys, that have used timeline genocide on our planet and are, are attempting to be the only species of Earth and trying to dominate and control us. So we added all together, there's over 9,000 separate species bloodlines intermixed into our drama hmm. for both positive and negative. So should I identify one or the other? They're all the same thing in the experiential base. You know, the reptilians have had, have, have had really been a bad day, but guess what? There's over 18 species of reptilians, and only one is here on the planet being bad. Hmm. So, you know, you can't knock any species. 
And of those 3,883 species that have been using timeline genocide, over 2,000 of them are literally within five years of their race being extinct because they've used cloning for so long that they can no longer have children. So they are desperate, absolutely desperate, to get us to help them regain their sex organs so they can have children again. Wow. And when you reach that level of desperation, you do anything. And some of those species are within a year of being totally extinct. Hmm. We need compassion, forgiveness. It's got to start somewhere. So ha has there ever been any attempts of violating the integrity of the safety of the Akashic Records? Uh, or are there anything that's keeping those protected or...? or the Akashic record cannot be altered. What can be done is the energy being can have, the being of a person can have, you can scramble the perception of it and create what's like a CIA redacted document where they got the black lines over it. It's mm -hmm. still there. You can't actually change it. Once it's written into the record, it's permanent. That's why reading the timeline wars, the last 54 million years of timeline wars that I did in Mount Shasta and I began with the walking and energy shows that really began with the galactic historian, you know, the rise to people going, what is this? How, how is this possible? And to begin to resonate with it is because quite literally it, is, it has not been heard before to the point where the resonation with all these people that want to get out of this machine that we're stuck in going, hey, hey, this is the time. This is the place that we use fear processing between limitation processing and understanding our expectations. And that system of domination and control is meant to limit our reality. And when new information comes in and resonates with the people that are in the higher vibrations, they begin to spread it so others wake up so we all get an opportunity to get out of here. But no, the Akashic Records cannot be changed, cannot be altered. Well, that's comforting to know, seeing how you've got total control of them and can access them for us. <laughs> and I'll be honest, there are other people that can, that in other times of our history, that people can do it. I made a personal choice on a soul level to make sure that I was soul family to all dramatic, all 66 lines of drama on every planet and every soul family. So I understood the big picture as a soul coming in, and that became part of my cellular memory and DNA memory when I was born, which makes me a natural person to be able to read the Akashic Records. And then you combine my story, my life story, my personal story of who I am, with the personal story of my soul expression, who chose the galactic historian concept because I chose to live in every soul family that was going to be a part of the drama. And when it came my turn to say yes to the galactic historian, not only was I fully prepared and ready, I had every single tool the galactic historian would need to see the big picture, even before the big picture was created. Mm -hmm. It's like watching a series of TV shows you know, for 10 years, and they come up with one episode later on. You got a good idea of how it's going to go. It's like watching Law and Order. You know, there's a formula to it. In the big picture, I get the formula. Well, I'll tell you what. There are so many more things I would love to talk about, like vaccinations, crop <laughs> circles, uh, the walk-in experience, and much more. But perhaps we'll do that this weekend. Oh, sure, definitely. Mm -hmm. So we are obviously out of time, but I'd really like to thank Andrew for sharing his wealth of information with us and for doing numerous readings with our N5D family. Thank you, brother. Yes, thank, thank you. you so much. It's been a pleasure. And I, I definitely look forward to working with you this weekend on the webinar. So everybody tune into that. I guess that, that'll do it for now, uh, Andrew. I'll be in touch with you, and we'll uh, synchronize everything for the weekend. And uh, in the meanwhile, I'd like to remind, uh, remind everyone to tune into in5d.com for more information about this weekend's webinar with Andrew and me, as Andrew will be doing more, more reading. So check that out on in5d.com. Thanks again, Andrew, for being our guest here on In5D. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Look forward to working with you many, many more times. Oh, definitely. We do, too. Thanks Thank again, you. brother. Thank you. Take easy, everyone. All right. Take care now. Bye-bye. So uh, next week, Kendra and I will be talking about the uh, current financial collapse and how it's actually helping us to transition into the golden age. And we will have open lines for that, so feel free to call in and tell us what you think. And the following week, astrologer Tom Lesher will be our guest. You can always find In5D Radio archived on our In5D YouTube channel and on iTunes. So if you subscribe to either one, you'll never miss a show. 
On behalf of my co-host, Kendra Gilbert, this is Greg Prescott from InsideD.com. Namaste, everyone. <laughs>